Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord, to St. Philip Lutheran Church here in Raleigh, North Carolina, for our service of worship and praise this Sunday morning. This is the second Sunday of Easter, that season of the church year in which we continue to celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ is resurrected from the grave. He has conquered sin, death, and the devil, and in so doing has won for us the forgiveness of our sin, free salvation, and eternal life. We are absolutely delighted that you've chosen to worship with us today, either in person or online. We welcome you in the name of Jesus. It is our hope and our prayer, as always, that this worship service would be both an uplift and an inspiration to you, as well as a comfort and a consolation to you in your time of need. We thank you, as always, for your continued financial support of our ministry here at St. Philip. It does not go unnoticed, and we appreciate you more than we can say. You may continue to give in person, through the mail or online via our church website, which is stphilip.org. That's st-philip1l.org. At this time, we invite Kent Williams to come forward uh, for a brief update on the Lutheran Services Carolina's Be the Light campaign. Thank you, Pastor. Um, for the last, I guess, six or seven weeks, you've heard different people, including myself, talk about the Be the Light campaign which greatly benefits the people with traumatic brain injury and the foster program in, in the Carolinas. Next Sunday, we will celebrate Be the Light Sunday, which is a culmination of the campaign. Uh, we are, as, as a church at St. Philip, are about 90% of what our goal was. Um, we appreciate everything that's been pledged, everything that's been given, and just want to remind you, these sheets, the, the pledge sheets are back in, um, the, the Northex, where you can pick up a copy. If you haven't done it yet, you don't have to give any money today or right away. You can just make a pledge. They're, they're, all they're trying to do is get the pledges completed by 2026. So we're looking a long ways out. But thank you very much. We appreciate what you've done and hope if you haven't done it, you'll consider doing it. Thank you. We ask that you please rise now as you are able for the thanksgiving for baptism found printed on page two of your bulletin. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, alleluia. In the waters of baptism, we have passed over from death to life with Jesus Christ, and we are a new creation. For this saving mystery and for this water, let us bless God who was, who is, and who is to come. We thank you, God, for your river of life flowing freely from your throne through the earth, through the city, through every living thing. You rescued Noah and his family from the flood. You opened wide the sea for the Israelites. Now in these waters you flood us with mercy, and our sin is drowned forever. You opened the gate of righteousness, and we pass safely through. In Jesus Christ you calm and trouble the waters, you nourish us and enclose us in safety. You call us forth and send us out. In lush and barren places, you are with us. You have become our salvation. Now breathe upon this water and awaken your church once more. Claim us again as your beloved and holy people. Quench our thirst. Cleanse our hearts. Wipe away every tear. To you, our beginning and our end, our shepherd and our lamb, be honor, glory, praise, and thanksgiving now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our gathering hymn this morning is Good Christian Friends, Rejoice and Sing. Thank you. 
now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God of life, you reach out to us amid our fears with the wounded hands of your risen Son. By your Spirit's breath, revive our faith in your mercy and strengthen us to be the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of God's holy word. The first reading is from chapter 5 in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. When one of those that were with the high priest had brought the apostles, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Word of God, word of life. The psalm for today is Psalm 118, verses 14 through 29. The Lord is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord acts valiantly. I shall not die in the living and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord indeed punished me sorely, but did not hand me over to death. This is the gate of the Lord. Here the righteous may enter. I give thanks to you, for you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. By the Lord has this been done. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna, O Lord, save us. We pray to you, Lord. Prosper our days. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and has given us life. Warm in procession with branches up to the corners of the altar. You are my God, and I will thank you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. God's mercy is yours forever. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the book of Revelation, chapter 1. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you, and peace from him who is and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, 
Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter, beginning with the 19th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. And see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in His name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this beautiful and glorious spring day in your creation. We give you thanks for the opportunity to worship you once again in spirit and in truth. We certainly thank you for the gift of each other, this assembly of saints and sinners, the ability and the opportunity to walk with one another and share our lives with one another and become friends. We lift you now, Lord God, all of our thanks and praise at all of your abundant blessings upon us. We also offer up to you now all of our broken hearts, our burdens and our afflictions, those things which confuse us, cause us anxiety, pain, grief, and loss. We lift them up to you and pray as always that you might touch us and heal us and transform us. We ask now, dear Lord, that you would speak to us a word of challenge and conviction of liberation and freedom, of hope, promise, power, joy, and love. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> My sermon text for today is the Gospel lesson, John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. My sermon title for today is Identifiable Wounds. Identifiable Wounds. The scripture opens up in verse 19 that when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, meaning actually that original Easter Sunday, 
only hours after Jesus had been resurrected from the dead, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear. Their fear is completely understandable in one sense, since they are disciples of a man who has just been executed for reasons of treason and sedition, it stands to reason that they too could be in danger. If Jesus was judged to be a threat enough to have him crucified, it seems likely that his followers likewise would be in grave danger. On the other hand, it is Easter Sunday. and Christ has been resurrected from the tomb, and even though they have not seen him yet, at least two of them, namely Peter and John here in this gospel, have been to the tomb and found it empty. There is some tragic and humorous irony in this for our own lives. Think about it, my friends, for a minute. On the greatest, most auspicious and glorious day of all 4,000 years of recorded salvation and scriptural history, those who are seemingly closest to God are locked away in a room somewhere due to fear. Clearly, one could say similar things about us today. Christ is risen this second Sunday of Easter, but we still fear not making ends meet financially every month. Christ is risen this Easter season, but we still fear for our children and grandchildren, our elderly parents and grandparents, for any loved one undergoing a treacherous path or a stressful struggle. Christ is risen this season of resurrection power and glorious vindication, and yet we still fear for our physical health, our mental stability, our emotional well-being, and our psychological balance. Many of us are trapped securely behind ironclad walls of fear, which paralyze our growth, stunt our faith, and inhibit our love. Regardless of whether it's Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, or Pentecost, Sunday, or any other day of the week, 2022, or almost any other year of our lives. Thank God Jesus walks through walls. Thank God he walks through walls at least twice in this text. Speaks peace to his disciples at least three times in this text and breathes the Holy Spirit onto them and into them, giving them the power to forgive or retain sins. Isn't verse 23 interesting, compelling, profound, unsettling? If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Think of how much power is in those words, my friends, in that bequeathing. Think of how much power you possess as a disciple of Christ based upon those very words. In essence, you have the power to forgive others their sin or to retain it. You have the power to relieve people of their burdens of guilt and shame or to continue to allow them to be overwhelmed and crippled by them. You have the power to free people or not. To uplift people or to keep them down. What if there is someone in your life right now with whom and for whom you are harboring resentment in your heart? holding a grudge, withholding forgiveness and healing and restoration, maybe for all the right and deserved reasons you feel. And yet that is bumping up against in this text, in this scripture, in your heart and in your conscience, the fact that Jesus Christ has been crucified for your sins, resurrected for your forgiveness, and now is giving you the same power to forgive others their sin against you that he has forgiven you your sins against him. It is an awkward thing, to say the least, not to offer freely to others what you yourself have freely received. 
not to extend grace and mercies to others, undeservedly so, while you have been the undeserved recipient of exactly the same thing yourself. There's a lot of power in this verse that we don't think about much and certainly never talk about. You'd think Jesus would just command us to go out and forgive. Forgive others their sins. But he doesn't. Not here anyway. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. But if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. He not only gives you a choice in the matter, because it's up to you really, right? But he seems to imply that your choice, pro or con, will have transcendent ramifications and heavenly consequences. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. It's like your choices here on this level, earth and time and space, affect realities on another level, somewhere else. It's kind of like what Jesus said to Peter and the other disciples in another place, namely Matthew 16 to be exact. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's some power, isn't it? He could have just easily said, look, whatever the Bible says, that's it. No further discussion. Black and white, clear cut, unambiguous, clear as day, just go read your scriptures. But he doesn't. He gives us power, the power of the Holy Spirit to make some decisions, to make some calls. If you bind it on earth, it is bound in heaven. If you loose it on earth, it is loosed in heaven. If you forgive it here, it's forgiven there. If you retain it here, it's retained there. That's a lot of power that we don't think we have. We don't realize we have. And we don't use, mostly because it scares us. Because we're so used to thinking of ourselves as powerless people. I don't call the shots. Shots are called for me. I don't make things happen. Things happen to me. I'm not a victor. I'm a victim. And while all of us have been victimized by unfair circumstances and even abusive situations in our lives, the greatest travesty and tragedy about that is that we let those things forevermore rob us of our agency, our confidence, our belief in ourselves, and the belief that God could use you, me, us, to determine anything at all, much less heavenly realities. But the scripture says, if you bind it, it's bound. If you loose it, it's loosed. If you retain it, it's retained. If you forgive it, it's forgiven. Thomas, one of the twelve disciples, gets a bad rap in this story. Popular history has even dubbed him Doubting Thomas. For his refusal to believe, as if he were somehow the weaker for it. That's unfortunate, in my opinion, for a couple of reasons. Number one, verse 24 indicates that he was not with them when Jesus came the first time. And since the rest of them are locked up behind closed doors due to fear, that at least indicates to me that Thomas was the most courageous of the bunch since he alone was willing to venture outside unimpeded. And number two, earlier in chapter 11, when Jesus receives news of Lazarus' death, he communicates that he is going to return to Judea, the scene of the death. The rest of his disciples discourage such a return, reminding him that many back there wish to stone him. And Thomas, alone of all the disciples, courageously backs Jesus, saying, Let us also go with Jesus, that we may die with him. So rather than coming across in the overall narrative as weak, fearful, and doubting, Thomas actually appears strong, brave, and courageous. Thomas, here in chapter 20, does what I dare say any of us would do in his shoes. Unless I see it, I'm not believing. 
The exact same scene repeats itself a week later, according to verse 26. In verse 27, Jesus provides the evidence that was lacking and which Thomas demanded back in verse 25. Put your finger here, Jesus invites, and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas replies in stunned wonder in verse 28. In what many consider to be the climax of the whole narrative of this gospel. My Lord and my God. Thomas goes from doubt to belief. And the result of belief according to the summary purpose of the entire book found in verse 31, is life in Jesus' name. There is an especially intriguing facet of this story that perhaps you did not notice. In all the resurrection accounts of Jesus, he goes unrecognized by his own disciples and friends, those who knew him best, until something startling happens. When Mary Magdalene meets the resurrected Christ by the empty tomb earlier in this same chapter, she does not recognize him and supposes him to be the gardener, actually, until he calls her by her name, Mary. Likewise, on the road to Emmaus in Luke's gospel, Jesus joins two of his disciples and journeys with them an entire day, engaging in conversation completely unrecognizable to them, until at dinner that night he takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them, and then and only then do they recognize their resurrected Lord. Isn't it amazing that Jesus is transformed enough in his resurrected body as to be unrecognizable to his own best friends by sight? except when he calls their name, God's word, and blesses their meal, God's sacrament, the Lord's Supper. Similarly, in verses 19 and 20 herein, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, look at your text, after he said this, He showed them his hands and his side, i.e. his wounds. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So one possible reading of this text, my friends, which will be consistent with all the other resurrection narratives, is that the disciples don't initially recognize Jesus when he enters the room and says, Peace be with you. Only when he shows them his wounds do they know who he is. That would also explain why he has to say to them a second time, peace be with you, because only now do they know who he is. Jesus, in other words, is transformed enough in his resurrected body as to be completely unrecognizable to his disciples and friends, and yet the resurrection is not so transformative as to eradicate his wounds. And it is precisely the wounds which identify him to them. Follow me now. Jesus has been glorified enough to be thoroughly changed. And yet his wounds have not disappeared. And it is precisely his wounds which offer proof that it is indeed he. Now, what if we ourselves, who have now been saved by grace through faith, have been changed enough in our own lives by Jesus as to be unrecognizable to some of our friends and yet we still possess our wounds which enable us to identify with others and have compassion on them. What if we ourselves who have been crucified to sin and raised to new life who have been blood-bought and blood-cleansed, who have been saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost-filled, and fire-baptized, have been transformed enough as to be unrecognizable to our friends and family as associates and co-workers, and yet we still possess the wounds of our suffering and persecution, our trials and our tribulations, which enable us to reach out to others in a spirit of love, long-suffering, and identification. What if we became more aware of our wounds and more aware of others' wounds? 
What if we became less self-conscious of our own wounds and less judgmental of others' wounds? What if we realize that our woundedness is precisely what we have in common with Christ and with other people? What if we believed that God was in the wounds? What if we were a church, not just of word and sacrament, but of word and sacrament and wounds? Christ's wounds are precisely what identify him as Christ in this text. Our wounds are precisely what identify us as Christians. When I understand your pain, and you understand my pain, God is present and revealed. When you forgive someone their sin against you because you understand their wounds, God is present and revealed. When you realize that what somebody did to you was less about their trying to sabotage and hinder you and it's more about their own woundedness in their own life's journey, God is present and revealed. When you realize that wounds are often passed down, unfortunately, within families from one generation to another, mostly unintentionally, because all of us hurt. None of us is equipped to deal with it or remedy it to any effective degree. God begins to be present and God begins to be revealed. We are all hurt. We are all in pain. We are all angry and confused and defensive. We are all struggling mightily to somehow make a way out of no way and to see a path through the murkiest of nights. And we are all locked behind closed doors for fear. But what if Jesus comes through those doors? What if he breaks down our walls? What if he says to you and to me, Peace be with you. What if he breathes on you and me and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. What if he sends us out and forth, equipped as the original apostles, giving us the power to forgive or to retain, to free or to oppress, to lift up or to hold down, to encourage or to discourage, to assist or to hinder, to give life or to destroy it, to liberate or to constrict, to release or to constrain, to loose or to bind? What if? He gives us the knowledge that we are both transformed and wounded. And it is our wounds which identify us as followers of Him and allow us to identify with others in their pain. What if Jesus does all of that? According to Scripture, according to this text, he already has. Wounds that identify are identifiable wounds. Amen. We ask that you please rise as you are able to join together in singing our hymn of the day, We Know Christ Was Raised.
sing together in trust and hope, we profess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. On our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all of creation. Holy One who acts righteously, equip your church as witnesses of your goodness to go and tell others of your abundant love, that they may believe that Jesus is our salvation and life. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Renew your people's commitment to use resources responsibly and to live well with your creation. Invite us to recognize and nurture signs of resurrection life in the natural world. God, in your mercy, Direct those who are given human authority to lead with humility and compassion. By your Holy Spirit, channel their attention towards serving those who are most in need. God, in your mercy. Hear our Uphold your children who cry out to you. Wherever people are overcome by the fear of death, breathe into them your life and peace. God, in your mercy. Hear our Inspire those who lead your people in worship and praise with joyful motion and sound. Send us forth with praise that we cannot keep to ourselves. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us the words of your saints who, like Thomas, boldly confessed your Son as Lord and God. With Jesus, our leader, empower us to live according to his ways. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, thank you for the peace and serenity we feel in your house. We praise you. Give comfort, healing, and peace to those we name aloud or silently. God, in your mercy. In your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. As the family of St. Philip, we ask that you open our ears to hear your call for us and guide our feet in following. Help us to be good stewards of our time and treasure and to put our trust in you to provide. We ask for blessings on the life of our pastor and that your spirit guide us in relationship and ministry. We put our hope in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. We share a sign of God's peace with one another now as well as with those online via the back cameras. God's peace be with you.
St. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the point, my brothers and sisters, is this. If you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that you may always have enough of everything in order that you may provide abundantly for every good work in his house and in his kingdom. If you have not already given online, we invite you to join with me now in making presentation of our tithes and offerings unto the Lord via the offering plate in the back. We thank you so very much. Please rise as you are able as we join together in singing our offertory hymn, This is the Feast of Victory for Our God. Alleluia. Let us pray. Living God, you gather the wolf and the lamb to feed together in your peaceable reign, and you welcome us all at your table. Reach out to us through this meal and show us your wounded and risen body, that we may be nourished and believe in Jesus Christ, 
our Savior and Lord. Amen. We celebrate together now the Lord's Supper, the Feast of Holy Communion. Now may the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places Give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Scripture tells us that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this. For the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we now pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The risen Christ dwells with us here. All who are hungry, all who are thirsty, come. You may be seated for the distribution. All are invited and welcome to the Lord's table. Children are invited forward for a blessing. Please follow the directions found printed in your bulletin and of the ushers as they usher you to the table. Come and feast, for the table has been made ready.
please rise to receive our post-communal blessing. Now may the eating of Christ's body and the drinking of his blood strengthen you, keep you, and preserve you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, generous God, for in this bread and cup we have tasted the new heaven and earth where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. Partners in ministry, what is our calling? Jesus, Jesus asked that we love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. Jesus tells us that a second is like it. We shall love our neighbors as ourselves. We answer that call, and we go out to share the love of Christ. Thanks be to God. You may be seated for a few brief announcements and mission opportunities, the first of which is if you purchased Easter lilies, uh, you may take them home today. If you purchased Easter lilies, you may take them home today. Uh, Bible stu Pastor's Bible study on the book of Acts continues this Wednesday at 10.30 a.m. and 6.45 p.m., both in the music room over on this side. 10.30 a.m., 6.45 p.m. on Wednesdays. Uh, now we call upon Julie Hillman with a couple of announcements and definitely mission opportunities. Thank you, Pastor. Um, turn to page 14. That is our information page for the week. And I encourage you to read it and make a note on the front of your bulletin. Read it, not see it, but read it. There's a lot here to look at, and uh, for those of us who are, are newer to St. Philip, there is a lot of things here that you just might be interested in, and there's much more. So today, I'd just like to point out for Families Together, I'm, the, um, I'm on the Fund Development Committee for Families Together, and we're in our spring campaign for fundraising. And on Tuesday, April 26th, not tomorrow, but the next day, is our Triple Impact Match Day, and we've had, uh, donors who've given um, special funds for the Challenge Match Fund, and it says they're 37500 but as of Friday, it is now $60,000 that will match whatever we give, and we're so appreciative of that. <laughs> we're good, and our campaign runs through May 31st, so if you aren't able on Tuesday, give any time, go online, there's the um, link. It's also on the um, uh, email that Jane sent out to all of us. The link that goes right to the page to donate, and we really appreciate it. And our goal for this year for the spring campaign is $400,000. So along with St. Philip and all the other churches and, and people in our communities and businesses and so forth, and a, a lot of help, we hope to reach that, and we trust in God to help us. So we thank you for that. There's also a signboard out at the information desk that gives you more information and some numbers and stuff with that to help the homeless families and children have a place to live in safety and comfort. And then I'd also like for you to, to uh, pass down where it says save the date. <laughs> I'm also the chairman of the stewardship committee. <laughs> yes, I'm there too. And <laughs> so we'd like to just uh, encourage you to uh, sign up for that day. And that's on Sign Up Genius. That's also in the email that Jane sent. I'd like to let you know that we invited Grace Lutheran Church, our sister church just across the way, and they're excited, and some of them already signed up, too, to come and join us on that day. We have room for 50 people, so come on, and all. And we'd like to focus that, let you know that it's budgeting for what matters most, whatever your goal is. And it's also for younger people, your young adults that's in your lives. You know, you can't start too soon without budgeting. So I think we might, we might all find something that we uh, have forgot about or might learn on that day. So please come, and we'll have good coffee and, refresh, and other refreshments for you, too. So do remember, triple match means for families together, if you give $50, it becomes $150. So I'm excited to give on Tuesday, and I invite you to join with me. Are there any further announcements, mission opportunities at this time? If not, we ask that you please rise as you are able to receive the benediction of our Lord. Now may God, the author of all life, Christ the cornerstone, and the life-giving spirit of adoption, Bless you now and forever. Amen.
are sending him this day is the day of resurrection. Hallelujah! Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah! Go in peace. Tell what God has done. Thanks be to God.